So um, we also have time for questions. Uh, two uh, rules of thumb for questions. So the first one is I like to call alternately on people identify as female or non-binary and people identify as male or non-binary. And the second one is that a question is, uh, is usually a single sentence or two sentences that goes up at the end. And while a long rambling <laughs> statement followed by what do you think of that is technically a question, it's not generally considered a good one. So if there are any people who identify as female or non-binary, you'd like to start us off. Uh, I'll send a mic runner over to you. Yep, over there. Can we have a mic up there? Thank you. Hi. Um, thanks very much for a really fascinating talk. Um, to your first point here, devices obey their owners. Um, we're getting to the point where the owner of a device is debatable. Yeah. So how, how might we address that? How might we address the issue of um, hardware ownership by the individual versus the corporation? You spotted me palming that card. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I did a talk a few years ago now called The Coming Civil War Over General Purpose Computers that is about the fight between owners and users. Uh, because there are lots of instances in which you're not the owner of a computer, but you're its user. And finding ways to, to mitigate that are, are hard. I guess, so my best approximation for a solution, I don't have a great one yet. Um, step one, uh, do something about monopolism. So one of the, one of the reasons that um, there is so little power between users and owners is because there are so few owners and their power is so concentrated. And, and without some step, to do something about that, we are we're we're going to have a hard time solving any of the problems. Partly because of their negotiating and political power, so any solution we come up with is going to be hard to make real. Uh, you know, the exception, the kind of wild card, seems to be trade wars, where like in the EU, they just they want to punish American companies for being American, and so they've made the world's first real privacy regulation. Uh, you know, not that it's a bad regulation, but the only reason it's so toothsome is because is not because they care about privacy; it's because they care about punishing American companies. Uh, and you know, I don't know if we can count on that dynamic. Uh, I hope we can, in some ways, that that maybe that dynamic goes away and we we go back to a a, a more solidarity model and, and and better governance. But assuming we do something about monopolism, this is where I start getting hand wavy. But a lot of our security models rely on there being tamper-evident secure modules in computers that can be used to uh, store and validate information in them. And what I envision is at least in some instances where you're physically interacting with a device that has a computer, like a rental car maybe, that you can park parts or all of its operating system and load in an operating system of your choosing. And this sounds very abstract and technical, but what I mean is someone sells you a little fob that's the privacy car rental fob, and you come into the car and you plug it in, and it does a thing, and when the green light comes on, unless someone's done something extraordinary, right, unless your adversary is a state-level actor who can tamper with tamper-evident modules without leaving evidence, then you have a reasonable degree of certainty that the computer is, is behaving to your interests and not to others. Um, but you're right that we have these blended property interests that are really difficult to, to navigate, and in particular, this, comes, this becomes very difficult when we're talking about privacy because we like to use property frameworks to talk about privacy and I'm of the opinion that those are not uh, great frameworks for it. That like, as, I, as some of you were at dinner with me last night, you know, if there's one thing the record industry taught us in the last 20 years, it's that giving property interest to integers never ends well. And so you know, it would be nice if we could come up with some sui generis set of, of rules and principles that treat personal information and privacy as a thing unto themselves and not as just a metaphoric form of property. Uh, and th that is not to say that they're not valuable. I think that actually our most valuable things we often talk about without, rec without recourse to privacy, right? Like if you kidnap my daughter, that's not theft, right? Like we have, we have a whole framework for talking about offenses and rights that have no recourse to privacy that are entirely about, about people. Right? Information is at least as nebulous a category as people. So maybe we need a set of sui generis rules that are about information and those blended interests. And maybe one of the reasons that we come up against this problem where we talk about um, users and owners is that owner is maybe not the right word to use in a lot of these cases because we're, you know, we, we, have, these, we have these blended, difficult to extricate interests that property frameworks collapse on. Are there any people who identify as male or non-binary like to ask the next question? Yeah, over here. Just wait for the mic to come up. Hi, 
that was very important information in that presentation that a lot of people should hear. Has that already been published in some way that we can spread that around, or is it about to be? Yeah, I mean, I've done versions of this talk that are on YouTube in different forms, and I, I wrote a book-length essay about this subject that's kind of disguised as a business book for artists called Information Doesn't Want to Be Free. Uh, and it's, it's meant to be a kind of, like, this is some good practical advice for people trying to sort out how artists can make a living online, but it's also really about how the important thing about the internet is not the destiny of the very small number of people who join me in the entertainment industry supply chain, but, you know, the much larger number of people who use the internet for every other possible thing. Uh, are there any people who identify as female or non-binary who'd like to ask the next question? Yeah, down here. Mike's just being passed out. You mentioned the baby monitors. How worried should I be about Alexa in my home? <laughs> well, that's a good question. I mean, it's, it's one that um, we, we have a hard time answering practically. Uh, there have been at least two instances in which security researchers identified defects in Alexa's security framework that showed that if they could get an app approved by Amazon, that that app could then turn the device into uh, a spy device. What they didn't try to do was get it approved by Amazon. Uh, and no one has systematically tried that for a lot of reasons. One is that it's hard to get past the IRB. Uh, but also, um, there's a piece of law from 1986, talk about metaphor shear. It's a piece of law from 1986 called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So in 1984, Matthew Broderick started a movie called War Games. And it kicked off a national panic about hackers. And prosecutors were in the unenviable and embarrassing position of not having specific crime, uh, computer crime statutes to make recourse to when someone did something really bad with the computer. They were doing dumb stuff like charging people with the theft of a microwatt of electricity because they'd broken into a computer and stolen its database. So Congress wanted to make a very uh, broad, future-proof statute. So what they said was, um, under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, it is a felony, an imprisonable offense, to uh, exceed your authorization on a computer that doesn't belong to you. And um, firms have now interpreted that to mean that if you violate the license agreement that you click through that sets out your authorization, you have exceeded your authorization and committed a felony. This is why Aaron Swartz was facing 35 years in prison when he hanged himself. He had gone onto a campus network where he was allowed to access the LAN, the Wi-Fi. He had downloaded scholarly articles from a repository that he was allowed to download from. But the terms of service said that you would only download articles by clicking on links instead of writing five lines of Perl. And because he wrote a program to download library books, he was facing 35 years in prison. And so if you're a security researcher contemplating submitting an app to Amazon just to see whether they approve it, even if your intention is on the second you get the email saying it's been approved, to pull it from the store and tell them that your, your app has been, uh, that, that their measures are inadequate, um, you face potential Computer Fraud and Abuse Act liability. And Amazon does have, like many big companies, an admirable tech bug bounty program that sets out the terms on which you can investigate their equipment and they'll, they'll give you money for doing it. It doesn't let you violate their terms of service and submit uh, uh, malicious apps to the app store for their speakers. And so we don't know anything about it. And so I guess maybe Amazon is so smart that they've made no mistakes in their vetting process and they've confined their mistakes to the security framework, right? Or maybe the mistakes are equally distributed throughout their vetting process and through the security framework, in which case maybe we should be worried, right? Maybe no news isn't good news, right? Uh, you know, it, like in an ideal world, that process would be fully transparent. One of the big problems we have now with both the Digital Learning Copyright Act and the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is in malicious mobile app research more generally. So if you look at the literature on malicious mobile apps, usually the papers start with, I got some apps. What they don't say is how they got them, because um, they, the way they got them is they wrote like an illegal crawler to crawl an app store, right? Uh, and then they violated the DMCA to decompile them, <laughs> right? And um, what is the biggest number one problem in scholarly work? sampling bias. How do you know whether or not the researcher has come up with any kind of 
uh, statistically valid picture of the prevalence of malicious software in, in mobile marketplaces unless they're allowed to publish their sampling methodologies. Moreover, you have firms who, in response to these papers, say, we took a countermeasure and now it works. So then you have some different security researchers the next year who publish another paper whose opening paragraph is, I've got some apps. And they say that there's more malicious apps or less malicious apps and the same number of malicious apps. You can't compare methodologies. Did it work? Right? Uh, you know, can you do a Cochrane-style meta-analysis meta to find out, like, across all of them? Well, no, because how do you do a meta-analysis? You compare sampling methodologies. You can't do any meta-analysis without sampling methodologies. So from a scholarly perspective, I think the answer is yes, right? We don't do good knowledge creation without transparency, and there's an enormous legal impediment to doing transparency here. Now, there's been some legal progress on this. Uh, First Look, which publishes The Intercept, and the ACLU sued the US government uh, because they want to create synthetic Facebook identities without Facebook's permission and against their terms of service in order to test whether Facebook differentially advertises financial products to see whether they're violating fair lending laws and, or, and advertising inferior financial products to people they identify as being racialized. Uh, and there was the, the government introduced a motion to dismiss. So they're arguing that the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is unconstitutional. The government introduced a motion to dismiss. Uh, that motion was just denied. Uh, unfortunately, the press, the way that they talked about this in many uh, outlets, was a court just gave the, gave the go-ahead for the next Cambridge Analytica to break uh, Facebook's terms of service, which I actually think is not a hard, it's not a hard uh, puzzle to break. There are lots of hard puzzles. This one isn't hard. Violating terms of service for a lawful purpose is lawful. Violating terms of service for an unlawful purpose is unlawful. That wasn't hard, right? Uh, and so Cambridge Analytica, out. Uh, ACLU, in, right? Not hard at all. Are there any questions for people identifying as male or non-binary? Down here. I'm hearing a lot of uh, a U.S. perspective on this because yeah. so much of the industry is here and so much of the law is here. Um, the privacy topic in particular presents a really neat contrast between what the law is here, what, uh, what the expectations are here versus other parts of the world. How is the security environment, the research environment yeah. in other parts of the world? Sure, you're right. And, and you know, sometimes we get uh, this good export regime where, like, you know, California exports auto safety rules to the whole world because it's such an important market that all the cars conform to California rules. Germany is becoming the world's privacy exporter. Right, uh, you can't you can't neglect Germany, and uh, and so everyone gets the German privacy rules, but sometimes it's terrible. So the U.S. Trade Representative has made it an, an ironclad condition of trading with the U.S. that you adopt the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in substantial similarity. So in the Euro in Europe they have Article Six of the European Union Copyright Directive. In Canada we have Bill C11. Uh, the Andean nations got it through their bil bilateral trade agreements. Russia got it with its WTO accession. Uh, Australia got it through its free tra trade agreement, as did New Zealand, and so on. Israel is pretty much the last industrial nation that does not have an equivalent to the DMCA, which is kind of interesting because if you think about like the ways that we affect political change, one of them is through markets. And so like American firms can't make potentially profitable things like third-party car parts without um, uh, violating the DMCA, but maybe the Israelis could and start exporting them. And at that point, there becomes this enormous pressure in the U.S. Like, why are, why are we bound by these rules when they aren't? And so you, you have to wonder whether maybe that would happen, because certainly Israel doesn't lack for talented cryptographers, and like, there's a lot of like, radioactively intense entrepreneurship <laughs> happening there. And so, you know, who knows? Maybe that's the, way, maybe that's the chink in the armor. Um, you know, and I've talked to some Israelis about this, some Israeli VCs about this, about the, the potential market opportunity. Unfortunately, the Knesset is mooting its own version of this. Um, you know, and it's not, it's not really because Israel is much better at resisting U.S. incursions into policy. It's just that the U.S. trade rep has had, like, other priorities in Israel that are, like, a long other subject we could talk about. But, but uh, they just haven't gotten around to it, and now they seem to be getting around to it. Are there any people identify as women or non-binary who'd like to ask the next question? Are we at time? We're getting there. Okay. Last question. No pressure. Go. Uh, wait for the mic. Simple question. Sure. How do we find good companies to interact with? Yeah. How do you shop your way out of capitalism? <laughs> <laughs> I try. I, I 
I write about privacy, and yeah. I try really hard to only interact with companies that that protect it. And I'll tell you my my opportunities of handling. You're right. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. And um, so, on the one hand, it's important that we take these personal actions. That, that it's important both for the cleanliness of your karma and for like the actual effect it has in the world, but you also can't recycle your way out of climate change, yeah. right? Like this is a collective action problem. And so I, I have a friend who you may know, Denise Cooper, who's a kind of open source doyen. And Denise said to me, I like was looking at my monthly bills and realized that I was sending hundreds of dollars every month to companies whose mission was to destroy the future I wanted to live in. You know, phone companies, hardware companies, software companies, and so on. And so uh, I decided I was gonna hedge. So she adds up how much money she spends on destroying the future, and she gives that much money to organizations working to preserve it. Uh, that's not a bad one. Sometimes, though, I think we have these tipping points. Like, I think Facebook might be at a tipping point. And I keep wondering if Facebook wouldn't be a great place to organize a movement to leave Facebook. Uh, <laughs> you know, there are lots of services that are more open and less, and, and federated and less walled gardenish than Facebook. Uh, and then there are lots of tools that let you simultaneously post to all of them, right? There's a whole project called Posse, post on, post own sites, share everywhere. And you could, you could post all your stuff to Facebook uh, with a little note at the bottom that said, I'm not on Facebook anymore. Here's how to read this off Facebook. You should join me. Uh, and then you could be in both places. You could even do like weekly challenges or monthly challenges for your friends. Let's see if we can have the number of Facebook followers we have this month. Uh, by convincing them to follow us somewhere else. They don't have to leave Facebook. They can just stop following you on Facebook and start following you somewhere else. And then at a certain point, you, you and all the people you love won't be talking on Facebook anymore, and you can go somewhere else. It's a cool idea. I mean, I don't know if it would work, but it's at least a way to harness um, a, uh, a kind of collective action. Uh, there, where you draw the line for yourself is a very personal thing. You know, like, I get my internet from a big, dumb cable company that gives a lot of money to anti-net neutrality, but I'm a Facebook vegan, right? And I have been yeah. for 10 years. I don't use Instagram, I don't use Facebook, and I don't use WhatsApp. Uh, but I don't kid myself that that's anything but symbolic. You know, it's, it's like, I buy, I buy Lenovo laptops, which I really like, but that's a company that's installed spyware, like, what, four times now? You know, it's, I don't pretend that they're virtuous. They're a transhuman colony organism that thinks of me as their gut flora. And so, you know, but there is, there is one big difference, and, and maybe this is for the Googlers across the road who, who might be in the audience today, between gut flora and engineers, which is that engineers are, are subject to moral suasion, and gut flora aren't. Uh, gut flora don't have will, and engineers do. And uh, much of the solution to the future is code. Right? Larry Lessig says that we use code, law, norms, and markets to change the world. And uh, there is a vogue right now to think that all of our future changes are going to come from law, that we should just regulate Facebook. There's a pretty good chance that if we regulate Facebook, the rule that we come up with will be one that says, if you are as big as Facebook in 2018, you can do a bunch of compliance stuff that will uh, let you continue. But if you're the smallest Facebook in 2008, this would bankrupt you. And so we never get another competitor to Facebook, and Facebook becomes the perpetual master of it. Right. But imagine tools that let you post on Facebook and somewhere else, and scrape Facebook and put the stuff somewhere else. Imagine tools that automatically go into Facebook with one button and rearrange the privacy settings to be optimized for actual human use. You know, ad blockers are a really good example of this, right? The first pop-up blockers completely changed the market without needing um, uh, markets without needing laws, right? Pop-ups were everywhere. Like, pop-ups used to spawn one pixel by one pixel, auto-playing music, and run away from your mouse as you moved it across the screen. <laughs> and when Mozilla launched the first always-on pop-up blockers at the same time as Opera did, all of a sudden, publishers would go to their advertisers and say, the reason that no one sees your ads anymore is their pop-ups. I know you told us that you would only advertise with us if you put a pop-up on because that was the only things people saw. Now they're the only things people don't see. And so pop-ups just went away because someone wrote code, not even very advanced code, a little bit of code, all the pop-ups went away. Right? N now we have new ad blockers that are really making a dent in the business models without needing rules. Right? And, and it's not that rules are bad. I, I just think that we need all four. So if you're an engineer, you can write code that changes the world, 
right? Like Mark Zuckerberg got people to go to Facebook by writing a tool that went to MySpace and scraped all of their messages from MySpace and put them on Facebook. Mark Zuckerberg sued a competitor of Facebook's called Power Ventures that wrote a tool to do the same thing, right? Every pirate wants to be an admiral. But the way that we get rid of Facebook is not just by making rules, it's by making good code. And that's one of the answers that we have to use here. The answer to the machine, sometimes it's the machine. Thank you all for coming.